This is Harry Marvel, CBS, London, July 29th, 1588. Somewhere in the English Channel at this moment, under cover of darkness, Sir Francis Drake and the English fleet stand face to face with the Spanish Armada. The decisive battle between Elizabeth of England and Philip of Spain, the battle which will decide the fate of Europe, the fate of the world for a thousand years, is about to be fought. Before another day is done, we will know whether or not the sun will London, rise again. July 29th, 1588. CBS is there. Sir Francis Drake faces the Spanish Armada. Alone, her fleet at bay in the English Channel, Britain girds to meet invasion. CBS asks you to imagine that our microphones are there sharing one of England's finest hours. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. CBS is there. This broadcast, the fifth of a special summer series produced and directed for Columbia by Robert Lewis Sheon, is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now, London, July 29th, 1588, and Harry Marble. This is a night England will never forget. This is a night during which no one has slept. All hearts, all minds, all eyes wait for the dawn. Because when the sun first streaks the English Channel with light... The two mightiest fleets the world has ever known will engage in the greatest sea battle of all time. This epic battle will be the climax of action which has been continuous in the English Channel for nine days, ever since the sails of Spain loomed out of the sea off the beaches of Britain. A cloak of naval security has been flung over this nine-day action in the Channel by the English Admiralty. We know little of what has happened. We will know nothing more until dawn. But here beside me now is Sir Walter Raleigh, Commissioner of Cornwall, Commander of Plymouth, Advisor to the Queen and her emissary to the New World, America. Sir Walter, we know that you are about to leave to join the fleet for the morning's action. We also know that you speak for the Admiralty and can give us information without violating censorship. Will you, sir, give us a picture of what has happened up to now in this solemn moment of England's history? I would say, sir, in all frankness, that we have succeeded to this moment in uh, evading the Castilians. You mean, Sir Walter, that... Drake is refusing action? Uh, not refusing. Shall we say simply postponing? You may depend upon the Admiral to engage in his own good time. Well, is it true, sir, that the Spanish fleet outnumbers Her Majesty's ships? Well, that, sir, is restricted information. But we have conflicting estimates, Sir Walter. Some reports put the Spanish fleet at 90 to England's 22. Others say the Armada has 130 to Drake's 90. Would you care to comment on that? Well, let us simply say that Philip of Spain has uh, considerably more tonnage, but that we have considerably more speed. Well, isn't it also true, Sir Walter Raleigh, that the Spanish Armada is really a floating army? Well, the Spanish galleons literally swarm with thousands of fully armed and armored soldiers. Once their ships have grappled with ours, it is their intention to board us and overcome our crews at close quarters. But Drake's strategy is to avoid this, isn't it? To keep his distance, to seize every advantage of wind, and to smash the Armada with his guns. Is that correct? Well, that is, shall we say, a rather interesting assumption. It is not correct, however, to refer to Drake's strategy. Howard of Effingham is Lord High Admiral of the English fleet. Sir Francis is his first operational lieutenant. But enemy information would seem to indicate, Sir Walter, that the Spanish Prince of Parma is waiting at Dunkirk with a fleet of flat-bottomed barges and some 30,000 infantry and cavalry. Well, that information has come to our attention also. Well, if Drake cannot contain the armada, the Spanish fleet will then proceed to Dunkirk, won't it? Pick up the barges and their troops and then attempt an invasion of the beaches of Britain? I would prefer, if I may, to speak at some length to that point. By all means, Sir Walter. Philip, to be sure, believes that because he's taken Africa, Sicily, France, Flanders, and now sits astride the stricken and bleeding continent of Europe like a colossus, he will soon be setting his daughter on the throne of England. He fancies himself tearing from the new world's virgin soil the seeds I planted there in Virginia. But the Spanish sun, I fear, is conducive to... Hallucinations. The beaches of Britain, sir, have not been invaded since William the Conqueror. And Drake must not, will not fail. And should he, by some foul circumstance, fail, should this blessed isle be defiled by Spanish boots, our last ramparts will be the bodies of our men. We shall fight them everywhere. And in the end, we shall throw them back into the sea. Britain, sir... We're not born to be slaves. Thank you, Sir Walter Raleigh. Here in our CBS studios in London, this critical morning of July 29th, 1588, there is still no news of action in the English Channel between Sir Francis Drake and the Spanish Armada. 
The news blackout imposed by the Lords of the Admiralty continues. But there is no blackout on faith in England tonight. Everywhere in England tonight, from John O'Groats to Land's End, from Eddystone to Berwick Bounds, from Lynn to Milford Bay, the church bells are ringing as Britons everywhere turn to God in this, their hour of supreme trial. For the sound of the church bells of the ancient walled town in Canterbury, for the service there now in progress, we take you to Canterbury Cathedral and Jackson Beck. This is Jackson Beck in Canterbury Cathedral. Here in this magnificent Gothic structure, shrine of Thomas a Becket and center of the new Protestant church, the people of Canterbury are waiting for the archbishop's invocation. This is an unforgettable sight. From the balcony where I stand, I can view a sea of heads bowed in silent prayer. The great waxen tapers throw their eerie, flickering yellow light over the supplicants and send weird, dancing shadows high into the vaulted ceilings of this old, hallowed edifice. If you were with me now, watching this spectacle, you'd feel as I do. That here is the spiritual soul and heart and strength of Britain in this solemn hour. The bells have stopped ringing now. A figure almost lost in the immensity of this space steps into the pulpit and faces the worshippers. It's the Archbishop of Canterbury. His face is set, sober and stern. And tonight he reads from the text. Oh, merciful God. Archbishop speaks. In this our hour of travail, we turn to thee for deliverance. We of England have sought to worship thee in our own way. And according to our own conscience, as free men should, as thou hast given us the right. But there are those who in their pride and lust for earthly power would chain and fetter us. We did not wish to sound the trumpet of war. We did not wish to take up the sword. But having the issue thrust upon us and treasuring freedom to worship thee more than life itself, we rise to meet the hosts of the invader. We know that thou wilt hearken to our prayers, O merciful God. We know that under thy benediction and guidance, the enemy will be vanquished, and that we shall continue to worship thee in thy sacred house. Amen. Archbishop of Canterbury has concluded his invocation. His words strike the keynote of England's stake of religious liberty in this war with Spain. The service here in Canterbury Cathedral continues with the singing of the Canterbury tune from Estes Psalter. This is Jackson Beck in Canterbury returning you to Harry Marble at CBS London. This is Harry Marble. Still no word from the Channel. But England knows that her ships are ready for anything that will come. And in a shipyard now, somewhere in the British Isles, is a man who can tell us about them. He is master shipbuilder Andrew McTavish. And our CBS correspondent, Ernest Chappell, is standing by to interview him. Come in, Ernest Chappell. This is Ernest Chappell. Standing beside me in this shipyard, somewhere in England, is master shipbuilder McTavish. Aye, yeah, uh, but I'm not a man for words. I build ships. So I'm told, Mr. McTavish. Uh, you had a hand in building Drake's flagship, the Revenge. Didn't you? Aye. I, I, I had a wee hand in it. Uh, I helped put down her keel and set her beam, and I shaved her masts and hammered her planks, and I had to fling it at her spars and rigging. <laughs> and here are the calluses on my hands to prove it. But um, I, I wouldn't have you think that I did it all alone. Nay, hey, man, uh, those uh, other good lads here in the yard had a bit of her, too. Well, what does the revenge look like, Mr. McTavish? Can you describe her? Well, uh, I'll give you what information the senses will allow. <laughs> And like all the ships of the line, the Revenge is uh, painted green and white, you know, the colors of the House of Tudor. Mm-hmm. And uh, she has the royal arms uh, blazoned on her stern and uh, gilded the British lions carved on her bow. Uh, the hungry lions this morning, you know, uh, hungry for Spanish meat. And how do you think she'll stand up to the Spanish men of war, Mr. McTavish? She'll dance. A bunny heel and fling around them. Now you mark my word, though. And so the triumph and the art royal and the swift shore and the victory and all the rest of Drake's beauties. They're faster and surer and swifter than the floating Spanish castles with their poop decks high out of the water. They are no ships for slaves, but for free men. And we, the men who built them, say this to you. Have no fear. They are no failing when this morning. Thank you, Master Shipbuilder Andrew McTavish. This is Ernest Chappell returning you to Harry Marble in CBS London. This is Harry Marble. Still no news from the English Channel. 
Four million Britons in British homes are waiting for news, but none waits more anxiously than a Welsh mother in the village of Nantiglow, Wales. We take you now to Nantiglow and Michael Fitzmaurice. This is Michael Fitzmaurice in the home of widow Agnes Montgomery in Nantiglow. Nantiglow is a remote inland town in Monmouth Borough, far away from any city. And widow Agnes Montgomery's house is a humble one, with whitewashed walls, hard earthen floor, and thatched roof. How many sons do you have, widow Montgomery? Three I had, and now but one. This night he serves with Drake. And the other two boys? They were Bert and Hal. They too sailed with Sir Francis in Baikon years. What happened to Bert and Hal? From Plymouth Sound, Bert sailed with Drake and good ship Pasha, at which some died. He has never come back. He was found dead on the plaza at Nombre de Dios. A Spanish knife was through his heart, but his hands were clasped about a Spanish throat. And Hal? Hal fought, same as Bert, for Drake. He was taken of tropic fever at Dominica, aboard the Elizabeth Ponaventure. And so now is left to me only my last, my Alfred, who this day stands with Drake on the revenge. Would I myself could take a pike or pull rope, but I am an old woman and weak, and I have not to give except my sons and my tears. And those I give. I hope Alfred comes back to you, Widow Montgomery. God willing, let it be so. But if it be or not, he will not be found wanting when the time is come. He is a brave lad, and he sails and fights for a brave captain. Thank you, Widow Agnes Montgomery. All England shares your faith in Admiral Drake. And in the Green Mermaid Tavern in Plymouth right now is a man who can tell us more about him. This is Michael Fitzmaurice in Nanticlow, Wales, switching you to the port of Plymouth and Frank Gallup. This is Frank Gallup in the Green Mermaid Tavern in Plymouth. The Green Mermaid is a typical English waterfront tavern, a pleasant and friendly place with its oak panels and deep bays, and the cavernous fireplace on which the great wood fire always burns. Here, there is the smell of mellow ale and the salty sound of seaman's talk. And here, sitting across a rough-hewn table from me, is an old sailor, Boatswain George Spry, late of Her Majesty's Navy. Uh, you say you sailed with Drake, Boatswain Spry? I, I sailed the Spanish main with him and through the Indies and to the New World of America. I fought the Spaniard with him at Calais de Lima and sacked Valparaiso with him till our ship was ballasted with all the doubloons in Castile. And were it not for the fever which took my leg, by God's grace, I'd be in the channel with him tonight. Well, then, Boson, uh, it follows that you know the Admiral well. What can you tell us about him? Mm, the Admiral has a nose for the wind and a heart like a rock and a hate of a Spaniard. Well, Boson, I understand that you were here in Plymouth when the Armada was sighted and Sir Francis Drake was first told about it. Oh, I was standing on Plymouth Hoe when the news came in. The Admiral was playing at bowls on the green. So Francis Drake was bowling, eh? Aye, he and the other captains, Frobisher, Hawkins, Howard, and Sir Walter Raleigh, too. They were here for a council of war and having a bit of fun playing this match of bowls as pretty as you please when the news of the Spanish sail off the lizard come in. Well, what do the Admirals do? Why, uh, Frobisher and Hawkins and Howard and Raleigh, they were all for hurrying down to the water. But not the Admiral. No, not Drake. Well, what did Drake do? Oh, steady does it, says he. Calm and cool like. Let's finish the game. There's plenty of time to win the match and beat the Spaniards, too. And uh, well, did they finish the match? Aye, they aimed their last bowls. The winning cast was made. And then they went aboard and prepared for action with their hearts as light and their nerves as firm as they had been on the whole bowling green. Well, thank you, Boson Spry. This is an anecdote to inspire all England this anxious morning. And this is Frank Gallup in Plymouth returning you to CBS in London. This is Harry Marble in London. We have had a report from our CBS observer on the cliffs of Dover overlooking the English Channel. He reports a dull red glow somewhere in the direction of the two fleets. It is impossible to tell what this glow means. It may be an action. We don't know. On the other hand, it Would may be without like significance. It we repeat, Marvel. our CBS observer on the cliffs Would of Dover like has reported a dull red glow me. on the English yes. Channel somewhere in the direction if of the fleet of Spain and England. But there is no official indication that... Got list, I shall Just a moment. You. Just a moment. I have been advised that you have been hearing another voice conflicting with mine. Yes. That is the Spanish radio. Radio Spain intruding on our yes, shortwave this transmission. This intrusion comes from the this powerful shortwave Spain. transmitter at Barcelona, Barcelona, with regular enemy propaganda broadcasts directed at the British Isles. 
The voice you hear is that of the British traitor in the service of Spain, Sir William Channel. Fortunately, we can cut out this interruption in a moment. But while we're shifting our shortwave transmission frequencies, you may be interested in hearing what Sir William has to say. Thank you, Mr. Marvel. I can now announce with complete accuracy that the Revenge, flagship of the English fleet, is on fire in the English Channel. The battered remnants of Lord Effingham's much vaunted naval squadrons are fleeing northward in cowardly flight. The intolerable affronts which the seamen of England have offered to Spain for 30 years are at an end. The capture of Philip's treasure ships, the raiding of his colonies, the open assistance to his rebels are finished. Britons, lay down your arms. Do not resist. In your very midst we have many friends. Yes, friends, Englishmen who will welcome us with open arms. Surrender and renounce heresy, and Philip II in his kingly mercy will be disposed to treat you with charity. If you insist upon reckless, mad intransigence, his regal patience will be exhausted. Your queen will be publicly beheaded. Shiploads of scourges will be set to score your backs. All adults will be either killed or enslaved. Thousands of Spanish witnesses will arrive to suckle your orphan infants. That is the mean... This is Harry Marvel, CBS, London. We have now succeeded in clearing up the Spanish interruption. The British Admiralty has asked us to declare unequivocally that there is absolutely no confirmation to the report which Sir William Stanley, the British traitor, just gave you. The report is just another clever enemy propaganda trick by the Spanish to cause confusion and dismay in the ranks of England's defenders. As far as we here in CBS London are concerned, there is still no news of any action whatsoever in the English Channel. And now, after this unexpected delay... CBS, with royal permission and in cooperation with the British Broadcasting Corporation, takes you to a military camp somewhere in England where Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, on this fateful morning of July 29th, 1588, is about to address her people over a national hookup of the BBC. The next voice you hear will be that of Bud Collier, our CBS correspondent on the scene. Go ahead, Bud Collier. This is Bud Collier. I'm standing on the balcony of a castle, which is the headquarters of this rallying point of the British Home Guard. The Queen is expected momentarily. A flourish of trumpets will announce her appearance. She will come out on this balcony and speak to all England via the BBC microphones, but the great crowd below will also hear her voice through loudspeakers spread around the grounds. On those grounds now are thousands of the Queen's men in cassocks of pale blue, Kentish and Yorkshire broadcloth, and buckskin jerkins and canvas doublets, their helmets glinting in the light of the... It's the Queen, Queen Beth Gloriana. She's just come out of the balcony. The Lord of the Castle is with her, also her Secretary of State, Lord Walsingham. The crowd has seen her. They're cheering. Listen to that ovation. The trumpets are sounding again. The Queen is holding up her hand. She's ready to speak. The crowd is quieting down. The Queen is a woman of 55. She wears armor. She's stately and calm in this solemn hour. Ladies and gentlemen, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth of England. My loving people, I have always so behaved myself that under God I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal heart and goodwill of my subjects. And therefore, I am come amongst you, as you see, being resolved in the midst and heat of battle to live and die amongst you all, to lay down for my God, my kingdom, and my people, my honor, and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman. But I have the heart and stomach of a king. And a king of England, too. <laughs> and think it foul scorn that Palmer or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm. To which, rather than any dishonor shall grow by me, I myself will take up arms. I myself will be your general. And with your loyal obedience and your valor in the field, we shall shortly have a famous victory 
over these enemies of my God, of my kingdom, and of my people. The queen is raising her hand to still the crowd. Again she speaks. And now I have news for you. News which I myself have just received. My lords Effingham and Drake have undertaken an action in the English Channel. The battle is begun. The issue rests with God. The Queen has just announced that an action has begun. This is Harry Marvel in CBS London. We have interrupted Bud Collier because, as you heard the Queen announce, there is action in the Channel. There is action in the Channel. The British Admiralty has given us permission to call in our CBS correspondents, John Daly, aboard the Revenge, and Ken Roberts on the deck of the Ark Royal. We switch you first to John Daly, somewhere in the Channel. This is John Daly on the foredeck of Sir Francis Drake's flagship, the Revenge, just north of Calais off Graveline, France. The English admirals have sprung a surprise with which they hope to cook the Armada's goose. They've launched eight fire ships, have set eight ships of the line of flame and are racing them in with the wind and the tide directly into the heart of where they believe the Spanish Armada to be riding at anchor. This is an airy sight, eight flaming masses reddening the gray dawn, which is just beginning to break, huge moving bonfires over the angry waters of the English Channel. None of the ships in the fleet can see the Armada. We're tacking back and forth, waiting for some sign that will send us into action. The Revenge is second in line. The Ark Royal, Lord Effingham's flagship, is ahead of us. Behind us are Hawkins and Frobisher. We don't know whether the fire ships will strike the Armada or not. The channel tides are tricky. The wind may change. It's a desperate gamble. But the English admirals, already outnumbered by the Spaniards, have sacrificed, thrown away, written off as total losses, eight men of war now heading for flaming destruction. The Armada is presumed to be anchored to winnard of the British fleet. But at dusk yesterday, both fleets were at anchor. And it was not believed that there would be any action until dawn. But Drake, Effingham, Frobisher, Hawkins, these four leaders of Her Majesty's squadrons have suddenly thrown this flaming challenge, this gauge, right at the feet of the Spaniards. The question is, what is happening to the enemy armada? We ought to know soon. It's getting lighter now, and the first rays of the sun are streaking the horizon. However, I can't see the armada yet. All I can see are the eight bonfires bearing down upon the enemy ship. But it's time something happens. And perhaps Ken Roberts, aboard Lord Effingham's flagship, the Ark Royal, ahead of us and closer to the Spanish can see more. Let's find out. Go ahead, Ken Roberts. Go ahead, Ken. This is Ken Roberts aboard the Ark Royal at the head of the English line. I'm beginning to get a clear picture from here. The eight flaming ships have plunged into the heart of the Armada. The English guessed its position correctly. Their desperate gamble is working, although none of the five ships actually touch the Armada. There's confusion among the Spanish ships. Incredible confusion. They're cutting their cables. They're letting go their anchors into the sea. The ships without cable or anchor are at the mercy of the tide. The great fleet is being swept out to sea. Galleon crashing into galleon through a tangle of riding cables. And here we go after them. The Ark Royal, the ship I'm on. Having the Lord High Admiral of the British fleet is showing the way with his squadron. And behind us in hot pursuit come Drake, Hawkins, and Frobisher at the head of their squadron. Racing in a single battle line behind us. There's the Revenge, the Nonpareil, the Hope, the Scripture, the Aid... That trumpet, that trumpet call you hear comes from the San Martin, flagship of the Duke of Sidonia. He's trying to rally the Spanish galleons. He's trying desperately to stop their flight, to bring them back in formation into that powerful battering ram of a horn crescent which the Spanish favor. You've got to give the Spaniards credit. They're trying to recover from their surprise. They're trying to rally. Their game, they're turning. They're going to stand and fight. But we're sailing head on. We'll be within gunshot in a few... No... No, no, we're turning. We're turning aside. Lord Effingham is dropping out to... Yes, yes there's a crippled Spanish galleon damaged in the fight of the Armada. It's drifting this way. Effingham is diverting his attention from the main objective. He can't resist the fate of the crippled Spanish galleon. But Drake and the revenge behind us. Drake is going straight on. He's practically taken command. Hawkins and Frobisher are following him. From now on, the main action is with Drake. Drake, Drake, it's all Drake. Back to John Daly. This is John Daly aboard the Revenge, and the hour for which Sir Francis Drake was born has come. 
We're moving straight in for the Armada, barely a hundred yards away. The Spanish are firing on us, and their shot is screaming across our deck. They've got a hit, and another, and another. They're doing damage. The wounded are screaming with pain. The men are calling to the ship's surgeon. They're trying to clear away the splintered rigging. We're still boring in, but our guns are still silent. We haven't opened fire yet, but the revenge is dropping, turning broadside, showing up what guns to the Armada. The 60-pounders, the 30s, the 18s, the 9s. You'll hear all of them in a moment. Our gunners are ready, and it's point blank range. We're out of range, but behind us, the ships of Drake Squadron following our lead are pouring broadside after broadside into the San Martin, the San Sebastian, the San Matthias, and Maria de la Rosa. Now comes Hawkins in the victory leading his squadron, then Frobisher in the triumph followed by his squadron, guns flaming, enveloped in smoke. It's a shambles. The English fleet has suffered some hits, but the Spaniards have been raked and blasted. The smoke is clearing, and what a sight! The water is beginning to clog with broken masts, wreckage, spars, the bodies of the dead. Men are in the water swimming for their lives. I can see three, four, five, six Spanish galleons lifting and sinking, and there are more, many more. The Spanish ships that are still afloat have turned tail. The Armada is running, this time for good. Here comes the Admiral. He's just come down from the quarterdeck. Admiral Drake! Admiral Drake! Are you going after them, sir? Are you going after them? Hey! The Spaniard is running, and if he pauses, he'll be swept to loot and scuttle off Dunkirk. We'll rake him fore and aft, aft and fore again and again. We'll lay our helms to his dragging sterns and shake them, everyone. <laughs> It'll be a long time before the Duke of Sidonia sees his orange trees that Samory fought. Hey, you men! Uh, Admiral! Uh, Admiral, what of the Prince of Parma, Sir Francis? What of the Spanish invasion boats waiting at Dunkirk? By the grace of God and the good Queen best lad, England will not be invaded this day. Nor ever! You've heard Sir Francis Drake himself say that England has broken the Spanish Armada, that the danger of invasion is over. The Admiral is moving about his men, talking to the wounded, comforting them. July 29th, 1588. Sir Francis Drake defeats the Spanish Armada, and England lives on. You have been listening to CBS Is There, the fifth in a special summer series of broadcasts of famous events. Next week, March 6, 1836, the defense of the Alamo. CBS is there. CBS is there is produced and directed for Columbia by Robert U.S. Sheon. Tonight's broadcast was written by Max Ehrlich. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>